very big discussion. <laughs> you made me scared. <laughs> <laughs> but I encourage the discussion. So, um, okay, so a little background about myself. I am, uh, my name is Vincent. I am originally from Belgium. I've been living 10 years in Vietnam. And when I was in Vietnam, I got interested in container links, Linux containers and started playing with Docker back in 2014, uh, just a little bit after, I mean, maybe a year after it got popular. And um, I, I, I started to join like the meetup groups there, give presentations about it, really interested into it. My job was not, not directly related to Linux containers. I am a software from background, I mean software engineer from background, but I was doing more of consultancy kind of things. And um, I really like this, this, this evolution that was happening. So I, I started to invest more time into containers and that's why I'm here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm just curious, how many of you actually, like, okay, first off, heard about Docker? Okay, pretty much everyone, right? Uh, actually played with Docker? Okay, a good, good amount. Uh, maybe um, thinks Docker is, like, totally secure? Okay, nobody. <laughs> One person. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so that's, that's basic, pretty much a good illustration of where, yes, do you have a question, or? Who thinks Docker is the only container concept out there? Who, um, Not me. Who has, who has heard of containers before Docker? Yes, right. Um, oops, I don't know what happened here. No, that's a good question. Like, yeah, of course, Docker didn't invent containers, right? I mean, they just popularized it. You say now you send people on tracks that you can't move anymore. They are trying that way. It's true. He's talking about Docker. Right, um, so basically, initially, when I, I proposed this talk to um, um, one of the organized Suman, um, when I proposed, I, I said I, I, I was playing with Rocket, this alternative container runtime from CoreOS, and uh, one of their core uh, principles of Rocket is that it is uh, composable and secure from the bottom up, right? So they launched Rocket back in 2000, uh, October 2015, uh, sorry, 14. Uh, and it was a big, uh, it, it resulted in container wars. Like um, a lot of the people that were, you know, looking at Docker were saying, really, it's not secure. Uh, Rocket is like a much better approach. And I, I was playing with Rocket and I thought like, wow, Rocket is really amazing. Uh, but on the other side, before pre while preparing for this talk, I, I decided I'm gonna have another look at Docker. So when was the last time, like, like anybody here that has looked at Docker, when was, is it more than a year ago that you looked at Docker? Or I, have you recently played with Docker? Who has recently, like very like in the last few months, played with Docker? Right, just a few, few people, right? So Docker has in the last year been working a lot on, on the actual, um, you know, the, the whole content trust and the um, image verification and, and all of these processes around containers. Now, back to the concept, Docker is not containers, correct? Um, there were, there were containers a lot be, like, long before. But what did Docker do is they, they did come up with like this, this way or this tool set that allows you to easily um, you know, build containers, ship containers, and run containers, deploy containers, right? Um, as far as I can see, unless you can contradict me, that was not so easy before. Or that was not, not like just a developer on his laptop just going run a container. Sorry, I'm, I'm not a salesperson. There were others like OpenShift, which were for six years, I guess, even before Docker. Okay, right. Uh, yeah. So what I think, because one of the latest announcements is actually going in the same same way. Like um, after Docker became so popular, back in uh, one of the first um, Docker conference back in 2014 August. Um, they, Google came with an open sourcing of their, the way that they run containers internally and they made it an open source project called Kubernetes. And um, I started to play with Kubernetes when it was not, not very like initially, but later on I started to play with Kubernetes. And I think it's amazing the way it works. It's really nice, composable, everything like that. I, I think it's amazing. But like what Docker announced just like last two weeks ago at 20th of June, that like completely like what, what, what is happening? I mean, what is this? Now Docker is in integrating all of this Kubernetes orchestration inside the contain inside the engine. And I thought like, why would you ever do that? Uh, but if you look at it, it's kind of the same revolution that what they're doing. I mean, maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's kind of the same thing, right? I mean, you have to choose. Either you go for this composable, nice, but a little bit more hard to deploy, more technical, uh, special thing versus this easy package, easy to run, easy to use, and everybody uses it pack thing. 
so it's a trade-off. I don't know. Um, yeah, you can go ahead. I mean, <laughs> no, interestingly, I mean, what I'm missing in the talks about containers is mm -hmm. we get a lot of people coming up saying this is Docker, that is Docker, those are Docker, but nobody actually stands up and says, okay, let's look at the use case and then decide is Docker for your use case or is it not? Because many pro problems that I see that are being discussed about the Docker universe mm -hmm. are actually because people try to do things that they shouldn't be doing. Like mm -hmm. the discussion about only having one service running in the Docker. Mm -hmm. Or oh, that people want to go around it and they find ways around it. But if you cannot live with just one service running on the Docker, then maybe Docker is not the container solution that you need for your problem. Yeah. And this kind of thought, <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, so also, uh, I'm now in Singapore since a month, and uh, I am involved with the Docker Singapore. So if you want to come, please, please come. Uh, I think we would really appreciate your talk uh, there as well. Um, so, or maybe not, but uh, we can have a good discussion <laughs> about it at least. <laughs> but you, you made a face like maybe you won't appreciate. But anyway, uh, also I, I am. I actually I, I did have a Docker shirt, but I didn't wear it because I thought I'm not gonna like. I don't want to be like all Docker, so okay. <laughs> but okay, so uh, and also I have to apologize a little bit because um, I did have a talk yesterday about the Docker new announcements of DockerCon, and um, I had underestimated the effort uh, in preparing for this talk. So if I'm not going into as much detail as you want, I'm very sorry. Um, I hope I can at least give you like a guideline or pointers if you don't already have uh, anything related, related to the newest announcements. Okay. Um, so uh, first thing is that Docker, yes, they get they received a lot of criticism uh, about the security. So uh, now they are they are working on their uh, image like it is secure. They they've been driving the, the security uh, topic for the last year in 2015, right? And they keep going on about it. So. Um, one of the first things is they, they visualize this like development pipeline uh, where security applies at every stage. So uh, it begins when a developer builds the first image uh, where you need to uh, be able to have actual trust in the developer. So you need to be able to sign that image. You need to be able to verify what you download from, the, from an uh, image repository that has been signed by the proper uh, um, you know, uh, authorities. Like it's signed by the um, actual developer of that uh, image or that repository. So there is, um, it starts with, with signing the images built on the developer laptops, goes on to actually um, verifying signatures on the repository uh, or the registry in the Docker world, and also um, verifies when it's being deployed, and also um, make sure that what you deploy on either the cloud or on your on-premise, that it is um, running securely. So they have been focusing on every stage of this pipeline uh, to make it more secure. So uh, first off, I think everybody here is familiar with the containers, right? Um, basically, a difference is uh, that they share the host kernel, that they use uh, kernel abilities such as control groups, resource groups, um, to, to control the actual access to resources in the kernel, and um, also isolate um, the processes using namespaces, uh, and, and using namespaces to isolate the, basically everything running inside a container. Um, so it does feel like a lightweight VM, and that's where a lot of the confusion comes from, where people are actually treating it like a virtual machine, but it's not. Um, okay. So first, little very very quick about C groups. So basically, C groups are um, hierarchies that are uh, under the um, resources, such as the CPU or the memory, and the process lives within a group under the tree. So you can assign uh, and control um, the um, actual resources of the whole group of processes. So that's how, uh, con that ho that's how when you run a container, you can actually assign the memory that that container is going to use, and you can do things like that. And that's been in the kernel. Uh, namespaces, um, again, also using um, a, a, a feature called namespaces to isolate the actual processes. So a con if a container needs to be isolated by the network, it's using the net namespace isolation, mount namespace, UTS for host name isolation, user namespaces. Uh, are isolated and uh, can be mapped since uh, February 2016, and uh, PIT namespaces for process isolation, right? So you can isolate things like that. Uh, and then, uh, apart from this isolation, which by itself is not really a security feature, um, or 
there's also a, a default set of capabilities that are assigned to containers. So uh, by default, uh, Docker containers actually drop a whole bunch of capabilities, uh, such as um, capabilities required to, SSH, to run SSH or anything like that. So there's a default set of capabilities that um, Docker assigns to um, a container. Uh, but you can always, when you actually spin up a container, the, uh, you know, F, like in fine grain, um, identify which capabilities you want to add or drop from those containers. So you, you have that control. Uh, additionally, um, App Armor profiles can be um, passed in, or um, more recently, SecCom profiles can be actually passed in to specify exactly which um, system calls the, the processes within a container can, can, can execute. So there is this um, additional configurability, that's all configuration of how a container is running in the, in, in, on your system, right? What is the option? Sorry? Um, um, SC Linux is applied at the kernel level. Um, there is a default SC Linux profile. Um, you can change them. Those, there, there is defaults. And the defaults because, because different distributions, right? App Armor is associated with Suze and uh, SC Linux with Red Hat. So, mm -hmm. but also, are they optional, or you must have one of these in any So it depends on on, on the distribution uh, what's available, and then it will uh, use a default for that distribution that Docker supports. And the defaults are not necessarily the best uh, things for your use case. So um, that needs to be uh, reviewed. And for example, for App Armor profiles, there's a tool from Jay Frazel. Uh, she's one of the Docker contributors that now uh, that went to Mesos and works for Google. She developed a tool called Bane that actually allows you to to create an AppArmor profile for you, so helps you with that. So you can you can uh, configure the profiles, but the defaults are there. So by default, a certain amount of capabilities are run, and and a lot of people they just use the defaults, right? Um, so in terms of security, there is definitely something that you want to review, I guess. Uh, the the actual defaults of those things, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, just to be clear, this one is on the host. Yeah, this is on the Docker host running the uh, the Docker daemon, so spinning up the container. So the Docker host um, runs the container with a certain profile applied to the container, uh, giving the container the necessary access or uh, eliminating what he does not need. All right. Um, next. Okay. So with all of this. Things um, they say it's secure by default, <laughs> um, but out of the box uh, default settings and profiles and, and additional granular controls to customize the settings give you an ability to the, to do a secure by default setup. Now, like I took these slides from the Docker presentation, so I actually thought about putting a question mark here, uh, but um, um, like I, I will illustrate some of the defaults that are not very uh, secure. Okay, so. That was the first part, like um, that was added. But then the sec second part is, a lot of people have been asking, like, what's inside my container? How do I control the actual like packages, the vulnerabilities inside the container? Because now, when you deploy uh, or you build an image, uh, it contains all of the packages within the image. And uh, who is responsible for upgrading that? Like, is it the developer because you're giving the developer the ability to define the whole uh, file system that will be inside the container? So, who is then going to take responsibility for updating if there is uh, vulnerabilities and things like that? So, and how do I uh, know where it came from? So, how do I verify? The, 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 the trust, how do I trust this container? How do I verify who built this container? And, um, and yeah, how do I keep uh, everything sa safe? I'm reading off the slide. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, first thing is they have this commercial offering, which I mean, actually, on every official repository on the Docker Hub. So, the Docker Hub is this public repository where people can push and it's uh, open source. I mean, you can push and everybody can download publicly, uh, or you can buy private repositories to have your little private repos. Um, initially, there was an announcement of Project Nautilus, which was doing deep image scanning on the images on, on the registry, and that was initially enabled only for the official images, and then later on expanded for uh, more uh, images. Uh, actually, I think one of the, the main um, targets of Docker is to to provide this, because if you are using the open source registry or open source re repository host system to run it on your own infrastructure, you don't get any of this. You don't get like this uh, image uh, scanning. So this is one of the um, Docker trusted registry or the commercial offering um, add-ons uh, for enterprises. Okay, 
Um, so how does it work? So when a developer pushes the, his image to the Docker Hub it, uh, or to a, a repository, then um, the um, a trigger, the, the security scan is triggered, which is extracting all the image layers, extracting the binaries from the image layers, sending it to the scanner, uh, who sends every binary to an, uh, against and, and checks the hash uh, from every binary against the CVE database to identify if there are any vulnerabilities within it and stores the results inside the database, uh, which is then presented to the user when he goes to see his uh, image overview. So that's um, how they explain it, right? Uh, additionally, they also subscribe to CVE um, notifications, so um, you should get a notification in case a new vulnerability has been found and, and exposed and declared, so you should get an, be able to get an email. Uh, the alternative to, to this Docker uh, image scanning is CoreOS Claire, which was announced, I don't remember, in April or something, like not too long ago. So there is a, a, a way that, I mean, you can run the CoreOS um, image scanning, and you can pull your image, and you can run Claire against your local image and verify if there is any vulnerability. So when you spin up Claire, it's going to download the CVE database, and then when you uh, point Claire at your uh, image, it's going to do a full security scan. So you can actually, uh, with CoreOS Claire, do, do that locally as well. Uh, then the second part is um, they have this Docker Bench script, which is a batch script that does a full, uh, that you can run against one of your running containers, and it will inspect your container and does a, do a full um, overview and make a, a general advice of how you should like uh, maybe um, change certain settings in your uh, image. Like um, it does um, based on a security benchmark um, recommendation. So using that, it's also open source. It's a bash script that you can integrate with your. Um, actually, yesterday there was a person giving a talk at the presentation uh, at the meetup. Uh, he's also running this Docker Bench as part of the CI pipeline. So every time an image gets built, it actually runs a Docker Bench script to, to give a full report back to uh, what are the, any any uh, bad practices in there. He did have one comment saying that sometimes they are conflicting. Like one of the the, the recommendations is to to not write to the um, uh, certain paths and uh, to, uh, to use a temp, file, a temp file system. And on the other side, he said that, well, actually, um, then there's another warning that you're using the temp file system. So it's like a little bit conflicting. But um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, the Docker bench update, right? So then the second part is how to the, the content trust. So there is this uh, project, Nautilus, that they uh, announced which is implementing the update framework, TUF. Uh, anybody familiar with the update framework? So the update framework is a framework that came out of Tor to establish, um, um, uh, it's, it's actually, it was spin out of Tor to make a general way of, of verifying that updates that are shipped are actually um, signed and, and, and are, are created by the persons that actually uh, are authorized to make those updates. So it's, it's kind of to, to verify that. And uh, the update framework does that with, by defining um, a root key and then a, a, a higher key of keys. So under the root key, you have like got uh, a lot of like <laughs> different keys. One is the actual um, like a, a snapshot key to, to verify that the, that the content is still fresh. Um, and, and many other keys, and it's, I, I don't know it by heart. But if you search the, the, the update framework, it's, it's very interesting to look at it. So Nauti, uh, Notary, sorry, doc, uh, Docker Notary is a, a Golang implementation of the um, update framework, and it is an integrated into the Docker engine. So, um, and this is one of the things not, not by default, right? By default, because I think backwards compatibility, when you do a Docker push or a Docker pull, it basically just pulls the image and doesn't do any verification. So if you want to use this um, Docker notary, if you want to actually do uh, trust the content that you're pulling and verify the signatures, you need to set the um, actual variable, environment variable, such as uh, Docker underscore trust, I believe. Uh, and then if you set it on, uh, then from then onwards, the Docker pull and Docker build and um, the Docker run statements will all verify the signatures of the images. So by default, it's not on, but it has to be turned on. Uh, that's one, one thing. So the Docker uh, content uh, trust. Uh, if you enable that, as soon as you start making a new, uh, new image and you push it into the registry, you will have to actually also uh, generate a root key, generate a uh, repository key, and, and, and then it will be kept on your local laptop. So it's, it's all very like... Um, 
like, oh, you know, I, I actually hadn't played with that before I actually started looking at this. So <laughs> uh, it's very uh, interesting. <laughs> um, anybody played with this? Docker Notary, Docker Content Trust? No? So uh, I, I, I actually have a bit of a demo script. Maybe I can try and run it. It's basically the, the standard documentation, so I can maybe show that. Um, right. Well, it's, it's the part of uh, verifying the, uh, the image. Right. And that's actually the verification like image scanning, the, the bill of materials. OK. And then the very last part I want to talk about is the, um, the new announcement of the Docker engine with the built-in orchestration. So um, how many of you are aware of this, that this new version, this Docker 1.12 was launched? Like three, four people. So, um, and that, that it includes this orchestration framework. Um, so I, I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, I did a bit of a demo yesterday. Um, I didn't set up the demo environment today, but I may try because I guess I'm going very fast and I think it's almost finished. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll talk about, about that. So let me ha have a quick look about like, some of the things that, I was, um, that were interesting to find out. So the first thing, if you do a Docker login, um, it will ask me to, to enter my username and password, and this is not my real password. So. I mean, it is my real password now, but it's not the one I use. Like, this is a separate account, so. <laughs> okay, didn't work. Okay, because, all right, on this one I didn't, uh, okay. That, I actually have here, this is my local machine where I'm on OS X. I enabled the credential store, and this is a CoreOS um, X High virtual machine um, where I actually did not enable the, the um, credential store. So, actually, I should do it here, Docker login. Okay. So when I do the login, okay, and that, again, <coughs> wrong, sorry. Unless the internet has stopped working. Okay, now it worked. So if I now go to the uh, root directory and go to the config.json, in there, there's actually um, a string which is base64 base encoded my credentials. So if you have access to this, you basically have the username and password, right? So, so here I'm actually asking, uh, I'm using JQ to read the JSON file. I'm picking up that, uh, that authentication index, dot, that authentication part, and I'm passing that in to OpenSSL to base64 decode, and echoing the result. So. By default, my password and username are right there. So this is just a password. Um, so I was a little bit surprised to see that. Uh, so the, the interesting part is, though, if you are using, um, you have the same on Linux, but uh, I've done it on my OS X now. So if I look at my config file here, sorry, all the way around. So in here, I actually set up my, um, my config to use the credential store of the OSX keychain. So to achieve this, I had to download um, a separate tool. So this is what I did earlier. I looked, oh, sorry, it's very small. OK, so what I did earlier, I did a Docker login. I looked at the config file, and I queried the actual data stored, and then I decoded it. And if you're on OSX, you can just um, use a native keychain by downloading the Docker Credential Helper, uh, which is the OSX keychain for, um, for OSX. And then when you uh, extract and enable it, you can then set up your config file to use that credential chain. And then whenever I, I log in, it's no longer storing the credentials inside my Docker file. It's actually inside the uh, credential store. So if I... Um, as the credential store to give me my credentials. Obviously, it's going to return me my credentials because that's how the Docker engine gets it back. Um, right. So, of, of course, being in the credential store, I, I assume it's, it's more safe, right? I mean, uh, tell me. <laughs> it's encrypted with my, uh, <laughs> my logins, right? I mean, OK. So uh, that's one of the things that, by default, this doesn't do that, right? So uh, you actually have to go in and, and install the credential uh, helper and then actually change your configuration file and set up Docker to do it like that. The second part is the Docker Content Trust. 
Okay? So um, I set up that you need to set the environment variable Docker content trust to anything else but null. Uh, when you do that, if you are trying to pull an unsigned image, so this is an image that I created without actually signing it, uh, it says that it cannot pull this image. So uh, from this point of on forward, my Docker client does not trust unsigned images anymore. So again, it's something that I have to set, actually, and not something that's done by default. So, um, but again, when initially they, they were doing uh, you know, Docker, it was all just get things up and running, right? And they didn't care so much about the security part. So now you have this backwards compatibility. Uh, so then the way it works is you have the notary. So if you're interested in that, um, so you have notary for content trust. Um, so you need to enable it. So when you push a signed image, it's actually prompting me. Um, you are creating a new root signing key. And, um, and that signing key is then stored inside my uh, credential, uh, in, inside notary. And um, so let me just check. Uh, with, with notary, you can actually get the signatures or the metadata from. So this is happening behind the scene by, um, by Docker. Uh, so notary is in integrated into Docker. And behind the scene, it's actually extracting the tags. So the images are signed by tag, because in Docker, every time you push a tag, it's a different image or a different layer. And uh, it's, it's giving back like the digest of this, um, uh, the Hashem, I mean, the, the digest, and um, who signed it. So because in the, the, the update framework, you have several um, roles. So one is the uh, root key, one is the uh, time, I mean, uh, snapshot. There's a, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, and then there's, um, if you see targets, it's basically the administrator of the repository that signed it. If you see uh, target slash releases, that's a delegated role. So it was uh, the administrator of the repository had got delegated the access to another person, to uh, another contributor. So you, know, you don't have to share the keys with other people. You can actually ask them to generate a um, certificate, uh, sign it, and then you can import it. Uh, into your registry so you can authorize him to sign images as well. So you have a control of who uh, you know, publishes uh, data to uh, the image repository. Um, yeah. Um, so and then the other part is you can, you can actually see the keys that are currently stored on my uh, machine. So, So this is showing me that I have these keys uh, stored in my trust uh, folder. And um, there are, yeah, there's probably things that I shouldn't be showing. I don't know. Uh, OK, uh, so that, that's one of the things, the Docker Content Trust, which was um, something that there's a lot of, I think, media about it. But I actually never really like looked into it. And I think, I don't know who, who I, I asked earlier, right? Not so many people play with that, right? So um, it's very interesting to look at that. and. Um, yeah, those are the type of roles, right? You have the road, road, route, the timestamp, the snapshot, the targets, and then delegation. So I mentioned about targets and delegation, and uh, snapshot and time, timestamp. So each of these have a, a different role, like the the timestamp or uh, the timestamp key is actually verifying. Uh, well, all of the explanation is there. Is, is the timestamp is, it guarantees freshness. So in case uh, there is an image on the Docker Hub that has not been updated for a long time, you will get a warning. The Docker engine will tell you this image has not been updated for a while. You're sure you want to run it. So, so you actually can be sure that, that the, the update that you're getting or the image that you're getting is, is fresh. Um, that's part of the update framework um, uh, features. OK. And then uh, finally, the Docker 1.12 announcement. Um, OK, so all right, so in, in Docker 1.12, they, um, they implemented or they took part of the etcd clustering. So it's a rough consensus, consensus implementation. Uh, and they implemented it inside the engine. So they, they call it Swarm Kit. And it's, um, it's a part that you can include. Uh, and, and with that, um, the managers are actually creating a, um, a consensus cluster, and also doing leader election. And a second part of this is that once a leader has been elected, 
actually every leader uh, is running a certificate authority and the leader authority is issuing certificates for every, every worker in the cluster. So um, if, the, well, if that leader dies, so then another um, node can actually take over the leader uh, role and, um, and it will verify the workers that are accessing the cluster. So uh, by default, like when I did my demo, again by default if you do docker swarm init and then docker swarm join, they are automatically accepting nodes, which is not the recommended way to deploy Docker uh, Swarm into um, you know, production. You should effectively use um, either uh, a, sec a secret token that they share for, clusters, um, for nodes to be able to join the cluster, or you should be using um, manual authentication, in which case, when you join uh, the cluster, um, the actual an operator will have to uh, approve that node for joining the cluster. So they have built that in. Um, every uh, certificate is um, rotated. I mean, the keys are constantly refreshed. They have an expiry of minimum 30, um, 30 minutes. That's the minimum for expiry. And they, they have a, a range of 50 to 80% in which that they will do the expiry. Because if every, every key expires exactly on 30 minutes, then all of the nodes will start to request new certificates and the whole certificate authority will be swamped. So they, 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 they stage it a little bit. So, so that's quite of an interesting uh, way because if you're familiar with setting up a Kubernetes cluster, you need to set up your certificate authority, you need to set up your public key infrastructure, you need to you know, sign your keys, you need to give all of this, and it's really, really not easy to set all of this up. Um, and so I was very pessim very. Um, pessimistic about this, but after actually like playing with it and seeing how easy it is and, and seeing, I think it actually has quite a lot of potential. And that's where I finished my talk. <laughs> so any comments, questions, hoping not too, too hard, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. How do organizations today uh, adopting this uh, technology? Because uh, we had a skeletal model of about 20 bands. And, what, and we have this all Docker uh, different kinds of like high tech startups. <coughs> all the all, all, all the CEOs ask this bank. So after seeing all this great technology, when are you going to adopt this? Uh, it will take us few years. Mm -hmm. let, let's see. So how do you see this? Right. Uh, let me tell you that this Docker 1.12 is a release candidate, and it's like it still needs to grow a lot. I think. So um, it will still take a while, I think, for all of this uh, to be fully enterprise ready. This and this and this, you will gain such and such. Like, what is the approach of another salesperson? I mean, it's not like I'm telling How would I? For me, like right now, I just joined um, as, as a DevOps person. Well, DevOps is kind of, OK, let's not go into that role definition. Uh, anyway, I, I joined to, um, to work on the build automation system. So um, what I definitely want to do in the organization I joined is um, to drive the adoption of containers, at least for setting up like developer laptops. Uh, so when the developer comes on board, he doesn't have to install the whole thing. Uh, running Docker in production, it may be, uh, I mean, we're not there. Um, long term, maybe. Um, I'm actually interested in Kubernetes uh, and the alternative to it, RocketNetes, which is using CoreOS Rocket. Although after investigating all of this, maybe, I don't know, uh, I'm still looking at, at op options. But I, I think um, I'm a big fan of, of, of the, the tools like CoreOS and Claire and things like that. So in terms of container technology, there's still so many players. Even Rocket is not nearly as, as established as Docker, Docker is. So for me, it would purely be for accelerating the build pipeline, accelerating the development process, and, do, and those, that part, that, that area <coughs> of, of the, uh, of the uh, implementation. I see people not, so I said something good. Taking these solutions into organizations, organizations you will benefit them in a, in a long while or like a short while? We'll benefit them. them uh, you, you're asking if adding this stack or this technology into the organization will benefit them like very quickly, or it will take a long time to get the benefits or see the benefits. Um, 
It depends. Uh, I think one of the problems is to, uh, what is the, 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 um, the developer attitude towards containers? If you're looking at using containers on a developer's uh, laptop, you may fa like face some, some difficulties. Like definitely they will not want to develop in a container. I see it more like if you're developing microservice architecture, you, at least you can use it to set up all of the other services that you're not currently working on and you have your service just on your local laptop to develop against. <coughs> so I, I see it in that way. Uh, it's kind of like, like a much faster way than to set up a Vagrant box and run all of these servers or run them locally or something like that. So, um, so your question was, I didn't really answer your question, did I? It depends on how many servers and all this stuff to the yeah. and it depends on if the organization is willing to take this curve yeah. and take like, all, all of the employees with them to this process. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. So we have to you have to analyze what is your status of IT in the company. I see a lot of companies who won't really benefit from from using any of them because they have a lot of different services, a lot of very <coughs> simple services that right. do not require a lot of management. Right. They have a lot of ops people who know how to deal with it. I forgot to mention I joined a startup. <laughs> <laughs> If you are working in a company, I think uh, there's other people here working in like companies which way more like um, old, old maybe uh, like. Of course, you really benefit from all of that because it totally goes with, with what you are offering to your customers, and you have to scale up fast, and you have to tear it all down if you don't need it anymore. And these things do not apply to so many companies out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, for instance, I mean, okay, so I like to use LXC containers a lot because that is a very simple learning curve for a lot of people. It's a system container, so they know how it looks like inside. And if you start explaining to them that, for instance, your mobile, if you are using Linux and you are a developer and you need to try out a lot of things and you install packages in this and that, and libraries, and development environments, and whatever. And <coughs> once in a while, you have to reinstall your whole notebook because it's totally busted with shit that you can't get rid of anymore. Then you use containers. Oh, you use. So this is what you use. The what? Virtual, virtual desktops. Yes, virtual desktops. yes, you can. But you know, the, the, the nice thing about containers is that they really don't tear down the, the power of your notebook. So you can have a lot of them running concurrently. Uh, log board and virtual machines. Yeah. So that's nice. That might be useful. Mm -hmm. Then you have, perhaps you have legacy systems that um, you somehow want to put on, on uh, the user resources in your racks or whatever. Maybe that, that makes sense to put them, to migrate them into a container, in a system container, and put them on some powerful machine. Have one machine running, have copies of them. If the machine has a problem, use the capability of moving these containers around between machines as a means of even giving um, capabilities of, of failover or high availability to legacy applications that you cannot manage anymore. Right? Things like games and like microservices. This is not the, the, the natural use. Making it microservices. This is what the the thought is going to be. Yeah. Uh, the, the the main main yes. Yes. Yeah, but they are of course in you know, this. Right. Now they took it to different areas. Sorry, which one? I, I mean, they, they tried, like, the initially there was microservices, but this was the solution. Yeah. Now they, they're trying to take it to different areas and see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I forgot you said something. Ah, uh, yeah, you mentioned that like LXC, like uh, one of the, I mean, uh, Leonard Puttering, he gave a lot of talks about system D N spawn, uh, basically saying that he was using system D N spawn uh, all, all the time, basically to to uh, debug uh, the boot process of of uh, actual kernel and things like that. So. So that's very interesting. The CoreOS Rocket is completely uh, built on of the separate parts, just, just using system DN spawn and, and, and just using uh, GPG signatures and, and a whole different meta um, disco discovery of images. And I, I really like that. And um, I wanted to also show it, but I thought, like, well, uh, 
just going to stick to this for now. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to apply the, the, same, the same idea from before. Security implicates. Very often, uh, people ask you, well, um, if you are a user inside the container, can you get out? Right. These things, right? And they say, OK, so by default, because you cannot tell me that this is impossible, it's insecure. Mm -hmm. But again, it depends on what kind of application you are running, if you even have users logging into that machine. Right. I think one of uh, Joel also made a good, and he also uh, highlighted uh, uh, back in April, right, uh, a little bit of the security issues. And one, one good uh, comment about it is also reducing the attack surface by just building on scratch images. So b just binary, like static binaries uh, deployed inside a, a, a container. And then why do you use a container? Because you can benefit from the shipping and uh, the discovery and all of that. So um, you have an infrastructure that knows how to run containers. So you just package inside a container, and uh, it's, it's basically like a, a tar with a little bit of metadata of how to run it. So, so it's always good to, to use that, that as a format. Inside and outside, which means that you can have your compromise on the inside, but still the outside gives you information about the right. effect that you have. So this is really startup for that. It's, it's getting from inside, outside, and that's <coughs> really well, you can easily verify from the outside and say, OK, is there anything that has gone on that I didn't see? But that even the people who did it, I mean, who did for instance, yeah, just as an idea, to replace some things so that you cannot actually see what they have done, but from the outside, you still can. Right. Okay. All right. Um, I think if you want to continue, you can also um, start after this. So we can wrap it up officially, and um, anybody who wants to continue talking can continue talking. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>